Greetings, and welcome to AJFF in Conversation, a presentation of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival and part of expanded virtual programming. AJFF in Conversation is presented in partnership with American Jewish Committee and made possible thanks to the generous contributions of the Helen Marie Stern Fund and other donors, community partners, volunteers, and you, our loyal audience. Become a member of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival today and help sustain AJFF during these challenging times. Thank you for your support. We can only do more of this with more of you. To learn more about our efforts to stay engaged and connected with you and our community, visit us online at AJFF.org or follow us on social. And now, the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival proudly presents our feature program. Good evening and welcome. I'm Rabbi Peter Berg from the Temple, and I'm delighted to welcome each of you this evening to our program sponsored by the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival, a conversation on every mother's son. I wanna take this opportunity to thank the leadership and the staff of the AJFF for bringing us this film and this important program to our community at really an inflection point in the state of Georgia and in our country. The Atlanta Jewish Film Festival has added so many extraordinary programs to us and given us such great content during this time uh, of our being at home. And I know that all of us are grateful for it, along with the American Jewish Committee and the Black Jewish Coalition. Thank you to each of you. The issues that are raised in the film that we will be discussing this evening, we see on the news every single night, we read in the papers every morning, and they're issues that we care about deeply at the temple. The temple is Atlanta's largest and oldest Jewish community founded in 1867, based on the principles of benevolence, the Hebrew benevolent congregation. And whether it be helping to start the Hebrew uh, orphans home or Grady Hospital or members of the temple helping to start the Atlanta public school system or the Zabin Parity Center, members of the Jewish community have been deeply involved in issues that are of concern to all of us. That was especially significant during the civil rights movement when the temple was bombed in 1958 by white supremacists because of Rabbi Rothschild's outspoken position on racial justice and integration. We're helping to award Dr. King Atlanta's honor for the Dr. King's receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. Today, all of the Jewish community, the synagogues and the Jewish organizations work together and we're wondering what is it that we can do? Because after all of the marching that's so important and after all of these discussions that are so important, it all must lead to action. The Jewish community's commitment to issues of racial justice is part of the central teaching of our Bible, that everyone has created B'Tselem Elohim in God's image because no human being deserves to be choked for eight minutes and 46 seconds until they die while police officers watch. Yesterday, I had the honor and the privilege of helping to officiate at the funeral for Rayshard Brooks. And it was one of the most difficult and powerful moments of my lifetime. It reminds us that the blood of our brothers calls to us from the ground, that we are our brother's keeper. We cannot stand idly by because it matters, because black lives matter. This film is so important. This program is so important. And the work that we do every day to create a just and compassionate society for all of God's children makes a difference. The question is, what will we do after this program to do our part? And we have uh, assembled really one of the greatest panels uh, to help us learn and reflect about these issues. A brief moment of housekeeping. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions to our panelists a little later during the program. But anytime this evening, you can chat uh, into your chat function. You can type a question and we'll try to answer as many questions as we possibly can tonight. It's my honor now to introduce you to our incredible speakers. Tammy Gold is the professor of Hunter College, a filmmaker, a writer, and a visual artist. Her films have consistently been at the forefront of social justice, focusing on issues of race and gender, sexual identity, labor, and the role of police in the United States. Issues of aggressive policing have been central to her organizational work, 
In 2004, she produced and directed the film that is the topic of our conversation that so many of you saw, Every Mother's Son. And for those of you who did see it, you know that it profiles three mothers whose sons were killed by the New York Police Department and unexpectedly find themselves united to seek justice and to transform their grief into an opportunity for profound social change. The film has won many awards and Tammy continues her work addressing issues like stop and frisk and so many related topics. Andrea Young is here with us tonight, the executive director of the 22,000 member American Civil Liberties Union here in Georgia. She is an author and well known by so many of us and respected so deeply. A lifelong advocate for civil and human rights, the ACLU of Georgia is a trusted ethical and nonpartisan defender of our civil liberties. Opposing threats, combating voter suppression, supporting criminal justice reform, protecting freedom of speech, immigrant rights, women's rights, and especially reproductive freedom. Andrea Young has devoted her career to promoting policies to defend and extend civil and human rights to all. Dove Wilkler is here with us tonight, the regional director of the American Jewish Committee. He previously served as its assistant director and in that position was selected to participate in the first U.S. professional exchange in South Asia. He's active in our community serving on so many boards, including the Faith Alliance of Metro Atlanta, the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, the Advisory Council for the Atlanta Ballet, and so many organizations that work on issues of civil and human rights. Dove has been recognized by the 40 under 40 in both the Atlanta Business Chronicle and the Atlanta Jewish Times. John Eaves is here with us this evening, elected to his third, fourth year term as chairman of the Fulton County Commission in 2014. He led with clarity and vision the state's most populous and dynamic county. He has a distinguished career that spans academic and educational sectors, community service, business, both domestically and significantly abroad as well. He believes in education as the central tool to the betterment of all Georgians. He has been a champion of the Grady Hospital Health System and has a profound interest in transforming the criminal justice system. And it's in this area that he has helped to lead our congregation, the Temple, as chair of our Rothschild Social Justice Institute Racial Justice Committee. What an incredible panel we have here with us this evening. All of them have bios that could take 48 minutes to read, but we wanna to get to the questions. And Tammy, we're gonna begin with you this evening uh, as uh, the filmmaker for this incredible film that was so moving uh, for all of us. It won an audience award in the Tribeca Film Festival, and it's striking and it's discouraging, I think, to see how little has actually changed on the issue of policing and racial injustice since this film was released in 2004, right? That's hard to believe. From Tammy, from your perspective, how has this story advanced since you made Every Mother's Son, or, or has it? And tell us a little bit about the origins of the film. How did you stumble upon this topic, and why did it become, for you as a filmmaker, uh, a priority? I don't know if you hear that outside my window. Um, Seems like there's a march happening outside. Uh, do you, is it, can you hear my voice? Yes. Okay. Uh, we've been having a lot of demonstrations all through the community I live in, so you never know when it's going to happen. They just spring up. They're all about, you know, Black Lives Matter, so it's pretty unbelievable and very exciting. Welcome to New York. Um, so, what made the origin of the film is that policing and policing in New York City has always been always been aggressive, and it's not something that I hadn't known about. But when Amadou Diallo was killed, he was killed with forty-one bullets. He was killed with, I think it was three or four police officers, and they were plain clothes riding around at night. The atrocity of that experience left me feeling like I couldn't go to work, that I could not go to work the next day. I had to be on the streets. And the only way for me to do that was to take a camera out. So I was all, I went to the funeral, I went to 96th Street, the mosque, and um, 
I was just walking on the street asking people why they were there and what they were thinking. One woman after another woman kept saying, that could have been my son, every mother's son. And it became clear immediately that this is a story that had to be told through women and through how it impacts the lives of families when there's a police involved with a murder. And so that's kind of the origin. But right away, I knew that it would be a cross-cultural experience for me to make a film like this. I'm Jewish, I'm not black, I live in, I've had a different experience in my life completely. And so we built right away a group that would work closely with us of advisors. And the advisors came from communities that were doing social justice work around policing. So right away, we decided that the lens of the film had to interact with community organizers. So Richie Perez, who's in the film, it was one of the advisors. And sadly, Richie Perez died before the film was released. Um, he was critical. He comes out of a, he established the Justice Committee, which is focused on police reform and issues of fighting police brutality. And then we had other advisors, all who come out of community organizing. So right away, we built a bridge in terms of the filmmakers and the community that would use the film. And I guess this is a bit about how the film began and who it began with. That as much as we were the makers of the film, we had a large group of people with us the whole time who were from the community, completely from the community. Thank you, Tammy. That really helps us to understand um, how this incredible film came to be. Uh, uh, to, our, to our audience, uh, one quick uh, correction. I misspoke. Uh, if you want to ask a question, it's not in the chat function, it's in the Q&A function uh, where you type the question. My apologies. Uh, now a question, uh, uh, Andrea and Dove and John, for each of you. Uh, a quick reflection before we open up to a larger conversation about the specific issues that are raised in the film. Really, I'd like to get your reactions uh, from each of you to just take a minute to share some of your takeaways from the film, how it frames the national conversation that is taking place that's going on every single day. Uh, Andrea, we'll begin with you. Um, well, I want to thank Tammy for, for making the film. I had not seen it, although I was very familiar with the three uh, cases. Um, and I am very um, appreciative also, and I think it showed, um, that there was community input in the way that you told the story. I felt very much connected to the mothers. Um, and as a mother myself, I have to say that um, I used to feel a little bit um, secure. Uh, because I have a daughter and not a son. Uh, but Sandra Bland and my daughter are the same age. Uh, oh. And I could imagine Sand my daughter, you know, going to a new city to start a new job. Uh, and, that and what happened to Sandra ba Bland could have been her fate. Um, and so I think it's so important to tell this story from the perspective of the mothers, because we do have to understand that all of our children are at risk as long as this behavior is tolerated uh, and perpetuated and, and the people who do it are protected, um, all of our children are at risk. And I think the voices of mothers are very powerful. Um, and I, I really thank you for giving those mothers, you know, that kind of platform. And we've seen that they continue uh, mm -hmm. to raise their voices. They continue to speak out. They continue to join other families who experience this. Um, and you know it has to stop. We've got to we've got to stop allowing this to happen in our country. So I, I thank you very much for the such a powerful witness. It means a lot. Dove. Uh, so thank you so much for having me with you all tonight, and Tammy for making this film. Um, two very different, actually, observations. The first one is I'm originally from northern New Jersey. And the, the three stories all take place when I was graduating high school. Whoa. And, and when I was graduating high school, I could think to myself that I didn't, sadly, I hadn't, wasn't aware of any of it. And we get the newspaper and we'd read the New York Times in my house. And, and I can acknowledge that, you know, these stories are so important to hear. And, and unfortunately, we, I, I, we benefit today from social media for the way that these stories are able to go viral. But so many of these stories and so many more that you weren't able to tell Tammy are 
are unheard of to most people, either because of where they live or the way that, that the media shares these stories. I, I think the relevance for today, it, it's, it's so sad how this film made, or the film that um, was first released 16 years ago, is still so relevant. The questions surrounding uh, these deaths are, are still there and we're plagued with them as a society. And it, it just goes to show how, how, on the one hand, how important these stories are to share, but also how difficult it is sometimes for change to happen and how long it takes. But, but, we, but we know that we have to continue because change will eventually happen. We just need to continue spreading this message. Thank um, you. Next up. John. Well, the film really resonated with me. I looked at it a few days ago. It was very emotional. And I want your listening audience to know that this story or these stories are not abstract. It's not theory. It's real. So seven years ago, when I was chairman of Fulton County government, appropriated funding for the jail, $100 million a year, the district attorney's office, $30 million a year, police department, et cetera. I got a phone call when I was chairing a meeting and the call came from my children's mother. And when I picked up the phone, when I was chairing this meeting, she said, emergency. And I listened to her. She says, Isaac, who was my son, has just gotten arrested. His last day, as a senior at Mays High School in Atlanta, Georgia, he was off campus, went to rehearse his graduation, came back on campus, and there was an allegedly a fight that was about to happen, and a police officer was there, and he said, nobody can come on campus. My son said, my book bag and my belongings are on campus. I got to go get them. He said, no, you can't get on campus. My son said, yes, I need to get on campus. Mm -hmm. My son was arrested. And I got the call and I had to go to the Atlanta Detention Center. Here it is, I am one of the highest elected officials, master's degree from Yale University, Morehouse graduate. I have a PhD, chairman of Fulton County, and my son, dark-skinned, beautiful young man, got arrested. And then after the arrest, I was able to get him out on bond. I went to the school, the principal told me, and I quote Dr. Eves, your son should not have been arrested. And I have no doubt that if my son were a different color skin tone, this police officer would not have arrested him and given him the benefit of the doubt. But the point is this seemingly benign thing that happened could have very easily have escalated. And my mm -hmm. son too could have been a statistic. And the narrative of this story could have been every father's son. Mm -hmm. So this is not the abstract, this is not the theoretical, this is real what's happening on our streets here in our country. Absolutely. Thank you, John, for, for the personal story. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I wanna ask each of you now a, uh, an individual question. Um, uh, Andrea, I wanted to ask you, knowing that the ACLU has, as so many of us know, a very uh, uh, long, uh, career of being front and center in the, the fight for civil and human rights. Uh, the events of these past few weeks have, have brought these painful and very complex issues to the forefront of our national consciousness in a way that I think is, is unprecedented, uh, certainly in my lifetime. For those who are participating tonight who may not live with these issues um, as you do at the ACLU every single day, day in and day out, who are really now stopping and trying to listen and to learn in ways that they may not have before, what do you most want our audience to understand this evening about what is playing out on the streets of Atlanta and the United States and where this movement is today? You know, I, I want, so the ACLU made a commitment a few years ago to reduce mass incarceration by at least 50%. Uh, because we over-incarcerate, the, the United States is one of the worst countries in the world in terms of incarcerating its own citizens, and Georgia uh, is the worst state in the country in terms of having people under correctional control, either on probation, parole, on jail, in prison. Uh, we have 
um, more of our citizens, uh, a higher proportion or a rate of, uh, of our uh, of correctional control than any other state. And we're spending an incredible amount of money and we have moved into this, uh, this era of permanent punishment. So there was a time when, you know, people, you know, maybe had committed an offense, they served their time and they were done. But one of the legacies of the drug wars uh, was permanent punishment. And so people with an arrest record, something, you know, that might be 20 years old, will still experience um, consequences from that while even though they pay their debt to society. So to understand that a lot of this frustration is rising from this this the criminal legal system kind of having people in this vice and it's become the new Jim Crow. People, you know, find themselves stripped of the civil rights that we fought so hard for them to attain. Um, and so I think that's really the, 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 the brutal murders are the tip of the iceberg of the consequences of this system. Uh, and that's why so many people also are in the streets is because they see that this is, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is the thing that we see. And of course, unlike uh, the 90s, now these things are on video. And so you can see the entire transaction. And uh, it's more difficult to say that, oh, that, you know, we used to say, well, they must have done something. But you can see that, no, you know, this entire transaction now is on video. Uh, and so to really understand that this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of how particularly people of color communities have their lives really ruined. People who claw their way into the middle class and then see their kids, you know, as what would have happened to John's son, see their lives ruined uh, by these chance encounters uh, with law enforcement uh, and that you can, you can almost never recover from in the system that the way it is today. And so we really want this, we've got to transform this system um, so that, uh, you know, we have opportunities for restorative justice so that people can make their lives whole, so that people can be readmitted to society when they pay their debts. Um, and, and that's what we've been working for um, at the ACLU for a number of years and will continue to work for. Yeah, I, I want to give that an amen. This is, this is the issue. And when we say that the United States is the worst in terms of mass incarceration, nobody is even a close second. It's not like every other country, including some of the worst actors out there, are, are not even close to the United States. We have a lot of work to do. So thank you for that uh, enlightening us. Uh, Dove, I want to turn to you now and the, the, really the more than 100 year history of, of the American Jewish community who has been so deeply engaged in this work of combating discrimination and inequality in, in all forms. And our Atlanta chapter has been really active and something that so many of us are so proud of um, in the cause for adv advancing black Jewish relations. The, the Black Jewish Coalition in Atlanta is literally the model. I don't think there's another that has existed for as long and been as successful than, than, than what, what happens here in Atlanta. So uh, help our audience understand a little bit about um, what the AJC and our Jewish community have done to engage in this movement through a Jewish lens. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting way to be involved in it. I think for the most part, most recently, and I'll, I'll sort of start now and then I'll work backwards. I think most recently we're really trying to take a supporting role. Right there, we recognize that there are times when the Jewish community needs to lead and there's other times when the Jewish community needs to follow. And this is the time for the Jewish community to be following, to be supporting, to be listening, to be creating opportunities to understand what many of the, what the issues are that are plaguing other minority communities, especially around the issues of, of police reform. We often don't think about it. You know, we, perhaps it's because of where we live and the issues aren't as present in our minds, you know, but, but even most recently, I mean, when the, the protests, the first weekend of the protests, I happened to live in Brookhaven and I, they came all the way up into Buckhead. And, and for me, it, it was, it was fascinating because I, I follow, I see, and unfortunately because of COVID, I, I, I made the, the health decision for my family to, to stay away from, from the protests, but many people have chosen to participate. And I, and I, it's a very noble and, an important um, statement to make, to be out there protesting in the street. 
So we've been trying to use our resources and connections to support the efforts that are going on. I'm so grateful to, to be on here with Andrea uh, and the work that the ACLU is doing is, is tremendous. She has a, a young gentleman who works with her named Christopher Bruce, who is a tremendous spokesperson for the community and who is doing an incredible job lobbying down at the Capitol on these issues. So supporting the lobbying efforts and informing the Jewish community, I think is, is the most important thing that, that an organization like AJC can do. You know, historically, and one of the reasons why the Atlanta Black Jewish Coalition has been so successful over its years has been because of the types of individuals who have been involved, right? People who care, who are passionate, who understand that they don't know everything. And we've been grateful to have well-known leaders uh, involved in the coalition. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt that Congressman John Lewis is one of the co-founders, right? <laughs> There's a natural affinity to be involved with the people who are who have been involved in civil rights for so long. But for us as a Jewish community, it's important for to recognize that we have challenges and that that we live in a community that has greater challenges than we face. And not to mention the fact that there are also black Jews in our community. Mm -hmm. So it's important for us to recognize that, that this is a Jewish issue, right? The film identifies um, a Latino, uh, an, an, African -American, an African and and a Jewish person. So it's not just that these issues are facing one community, right? They are facing our community, our community the city of Atlanta, the metro Atlanta area, the, the state of Georgia and the United States, this is an issue that's plaguing all of us. And so as, a, as, a, as members of this community, we need to be aware of what's going on. Well, Dov, you teed it up perfectly for John. Uh, uh, that's a perfect transition because um, John, you bring uh, a, a really a compelling perspective to the conversation. Um, as an African-American man, as a Jew, a leader at our temple, uh, and a political figure who has government and educational background. Um, how have these most recent events impacted you personally? So I do have a double sensitivity uh, in terms of injustice uh, as an African-American, as a Jewish person, historically and currently, you know, being the victim of persecution and oppression and discrimination. So I have a heightened sensitivity. But as you pointed out earlier, Rabbi Berg, there sort of is a historical alliance between uh, the Jewish community here in Atlanta, specifically the temple and the black community and specifically with Ebenezer Baptist Church. And so to me, I have brought this perspective in terms of how can we work together? How can we build bridges to address this issue of over-incarceration as Andrew Young pointed out, the high number of people who are incarcerated in uh, Fulton County and the metropolitan Atlanta area. And so we've really worked together as a community or communities in terms of what's called record restriction. And so you have uh, thousands and thousands of people who have been arrested and never had their case adjudicated and the disposition of their um, arrests is still on their records. And so these uh, records follow them in terms of the inability of getting a job or retaining a job or getting financial aid to go to college or university or to uh, live in public housing where you receive public assistance. And so we have masterfully, masterfully col uh, collaborated as a black community and as a Jewish community in terms of having a public uh, summit to expunge the record or restrict the records mm -hmm. of ex-offenders. And so I think that that has been a great example of partnership, but also this duality of two communities uh, having a single purpose in terms of resurrecting lives. Mm -hmm. And John, you've been our champion. We could not thank you enough for your leadership in, in that realm. Uh, uh, Tammy, I'm going to ask you a question now and remind our audience after this question, we're going to move to Q&A for, for you. So please, uh, in your Q&A function, uh, don't hesitate to, to uh, uh, type in any of your questions. Uh, Tammy, uh, much of the discussion that we're, we're seeing today and all of us are talking about around understanding what it really means to live as a black person in America revolves around this uh, need to walk in someone else's shoes. So uh, my question for you is, as a filmmaker, um, how does one overcome bias and blind spots in trying to tell another person's story? Mm -hmm. I th it's a really important question, and I think we'll always have blind spots as white people, um, and, and Jewish people, and Jewish white people, I should 
to be specific, have a lot of uh, blind spots when it comes to their own racism, as do I. So I would never say that I'm different than any, anyone else, but I struggle. And I would say walking in somebody else's shoes is really important to talk about. And it's a very big question. And it's a big question for people who are filmmakers, cultural makers, cultural workers, to tell other people's stories. That's a problem. That's a fundamental problem. And one of the reasons why we work so hard with organizations and activists and people of color who were really involved with the making of this film is so that, the, that my own blind spots won't eclipse the real message we wanted to make. And I think the success of the film is that bridge we had with organizers. When, when you ask the other question, I just wanted to jump in a second. The question of what do we do now? What do we do? There's a movement growing, the Black Lives Movement, the uh, Latinx movement in support of Black Lives. There's tons of things happening. At the root, we have to look at white supremacy because a knee of a police officer on the neck of an African-American man for eight minutes is not in isolation to what's happening with COVID-19. And why are Blacks in the United States dying at higher rate per percentagely than white people? It's because of the racism in the healthcare system. Why is housing a crisis in every urban area? It's because the knee on the neck is the knee on everything in this country. It's grounded, it's founded on white supremacy. And so to me, what we have to do is tease that apart, break that down, and that is hard. But that to me is gonna uplift the struggle to really change how we see structures, including the police, and include, including very much the criminal justice system overall. I mean, I think about Rikers. Rikers Island, the majority of people who are there have never even had a trial, have, don't even know why they're there, don't even know what the charges are. And they're there, they're there during COVID. They're there at this point of, of the heat, of the summer coming. This is all grounded in the same system. And it's really not just capitalism gone amok, it's white supremacy. And I think our work is there to expose it and to tease it apart. I agree with you so very much. In fact, Dove and I are working on some programs that we're about to announce uh, in partnership with so many members of the community exactly on the theme of white supremacy. And I really believe if you want to understand um, all of the evils, uh, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, mm -hmm. racism, uh, 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 it's all rooted in in uh, white supremacy, mm -hmm. and, and that's the topic that we all have to get our, you know, we really have to get to it. So thank you for sharing that. Um, there are uh, so many wonderful questions and we're gonna get to them now. Uh, there are a couple of questions uh, that, that have come in. Uh, Sari asked a question about uh, politics around uh, the issues that we're talking about in, in Georgia and, and how we can get engaged, um, given the uh, uh, politics that we see every day. Uh, any of our panelists wanna take a shot at that? Well, uh, you know, elections matter. Uh, and, you know, what we've seen even in, even in the opportunity to respond, I think people on the Atlanta City Council, for example, need to hear what people think. People on the Fulton County Commission need to hear because people make assumptions. Um, I think we're, we're seeing in the polling that Black Lives Matter now uh, is actually garnering a lot more support and people are starting to get it. Uh, but your elected officials need to know that you get it and that you care and that you want to see action um, in these areas. And, and, uh, and I think that, that actually the people are ahead of a lot of the elected officials on this issue right now. Uh, and I know for a lot of folks, you know, their, their kids and their grandkids, you know, are really taking them to school. And one of the things we have to do also is to listen. A little of this has to evolve. Uh, because we have so many, we have, this is really a paradigm shift about how we do public safety so that everyone in our community can feel safe. 
um, and that's and everyone doesn't feel safe right now. And so I think we have to really listen. And but I think we but let your elected officials know uh, that you want you want response uh, to the demands that are coming from the protesters. That you want change. That you want police officers held accountable for misconduct, and that people you know who wreck cars and are guilty of excess violence need, don't need to be on the force. Um, and so, you know, people need to hear from uh, the most respectable people in the community that they actually care and are listening to what the kids in the street are saying. Peter, can I jump behind uh, Andrea? I think mm -hmm. she said it well in terms of the voting. So there are three ways, at least three ways that people can get involved. You can actually vote as an individual. You can go out on the street and protest like thousands and thousands of people have done over the past several weeks, but I think the most effective way that you can affect change is advocacy. For me, as a former chairman of county government, chairing meetings, when you have 10, 15, 20, 30 people who come down to our meetings and advocate for or against and have an influence on the decision of the policymakers in terms of approving a policy or not approving a policy, to me, that's the most effective way that you can affect the political process. And so people sometimes forget that going to city hall, or going to the county commission meeting, or going to the school board meeting, in numbers advocating or for or against being attuned to what policy is being considered, that is the best way to affect change in our society is advocacy. Thank you. Can I, Peter, can I just jump on the advocacy Point sure. that John just made. I, we, we have to remember, and, and John listed it, right? It, it's it's the school boards, it's the city councils, it's the county commissions, it's the state legislatures, uh -huh. and it's the federal members. It's all five. And just remember that because if no matter how small your town might be, whether you're in Brookhaven or Shambly or Doraville, each of them has a city council. So it's not just about the city of Atlanta or the DeKalb County Commission or the Fulton County Commission. It's every single level you have an opportunity uh, to advocate on. Yeah, and there are uh, sheriffs uh, up for re-election right now, uh, district attorneys up for re-election right now. All of those matter. District attorneys, that's a big one. Thank big you. One. Uh, Tammy, uh, there are a couple, couple questions on the film. Uh, uh, one is if you could give us a brief update on the, on the, the three uh, families that, that are depicted in the film, uh, and what are you working on right now? Well, Iris Baez is still an activist. She'll always be an activist. She moved to Florida, but she flies up to New York when there's meetings. She goes um, regularly to Washington, D.C. They're advocating. There's, the families are still leading the struggle. They might not be on the streets. They maybe have, are a little older, but they're still, they're still at the front. Uh, Cariato Diallo has a foundation, she speaks publicly, she's a charismatic spokeswoman, and she's out there. Um, Doris bush is is less present, um, and um, I think it was hard, and I think there's something painful about that, and we as Jews, and um, from Jewish communities, and we have families who are Jewish, Iris was left alone. There wasn't a Jewish outcry outside of JFridge, and that's Jews for Racial and Economic Justice in New York City. But the religious Jewish community didn't come out. And the um, other sectors of the Jewish community, like, you know, just like centers. Um, so she, the community she cre that, that she received the support from was from the Black and the Latin community. And I think that it wasn't easy for Doris to continue struggling in the same way as it was for Iris and for Kariatu, because community is critical. And we are all connected in a way that when we have leaders of movements, we have to be there to support our leaders. And these mothers are leaders. So you really see when there's a support and when there's not a support, what happens to the activists. Um, now, what was the other part of the, oh, what am I working on? Um, there's a book out 
that um, is called The End of Policing that Alex Vitale wrote. And I'm sure your listeners, your, your, your viewers know the book. It's called, or if you don't get it, The End of Policing. It came out in 2017. And Alex and I decided to do a film that would also address, this is way before all this new movement coming um, throughout the country and throughout the world around police violence. And we, the, the book looks at, diff, the, every book, every chapter in the book looks at a different issue from uh, the issue of uh, the homeless, the issue of sex work, every aspect of where policing is, police in the schools, um, the, crimin the, the high school or the school to prison pipeline. So I started working on that with Alex. And at this point, we're just working on one of the sections, which is the decriminalization of sex work. The film is called Policing Our Bodies. And we're in production, we're working very hard at um, kind of really breaking through a lot of stigma around sex work and understanding that sex work is not trafficking and that the police involved with the criminalization of sex workers is creating a cycle of problems because then someone gets busted, then they have a record, then they can't get housing, then they can't get another job. It's secular. When the police are involved, it creates a crisis to the most vulnerable. And the main person in the film, her name is T.S. Candy and she's Southern, she's African American, she's trans, and she's a sex worker. And her journey into activism is unbelievable because you really see in the film how she takes the small steps at the beginning and now she's front and center in the movement of really decriminalizing sex work but understanding what abolition really is. And abolition is really at the core for me, for Alex, and for the film that we're doing. So it's policing our bodies and it's about, you know, policing the bodies of sex workers without understanding what sex work is, who goes into sex work, what does it mean to do survival work, why do we have the police there? Well, wish you strength as you do that and know that you've got now a huge, uh, a huge audience that will surely uh, be the first to, to sign up to, to, to watch. Good. Um, uh, I'm going to ask a question now. We'll only have time for one or two to answer it, but I've been lobbing softballs up until now. So this is, this is a harder <laughs> question. Um, uh, the, the Black Lives Movement has not been without critic and controversy, sometimes rooted, I think often rooted in, in misperception and misinformation to be sure. Uh, but as we all seek to educate each other and build bridges of understanding, what do you see as the points of conflict and misconception between the movement and the black and Jewish communities? Uh, if, if one or two of you would like to take a shot at, um, you know, a semester's question. Uh, well, I have an answer. I'm not sure your audience will be happy. <laughs> um, the movement for black lives was very, is very courageous and they did an amazing thing. They took on the question of Palestine. And I don't know if all of, all of you know that, but part of the mission is to look at the question of the occupation in Palestine, of Israel. So Dove, and I, just, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Dove, because uh, I know that uh, he, uh, he issued Okay, a go to it, today. go for it. So, so I, I think there's two things to understand, right? One is, is the movement, is Black Lives Matter, and the movement, and the hashtag, and the banner, and the, the idea. That, that I believe that we, that many, most, if not all of us can, can support. Um, the, the controversy related to the Movement for Black Lives, which is an umbrella organization, I, 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 I had to say that I vehemently disagree with Tammy. I don't think it was courageous. Uh, I think that it was completely unnecessary. Um, and I think it conflates an issue that's, that actually takes away from a very, what, what is otherwise a very, you know, interesting platform of policy changes. Um, you know, and, and although it, it is a small part of the, the invest divest platform of the movement for black lives, which talks about um, uh, cutting military aid, foreign aid, uh, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, it's created a challenge in the Jewish community for who, how many in the, or, in the community are associating themselves with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and, 
and people are not marching under the banner of an organization for the movement for black lives. At least I don't believe that they are. And they're not necessarily marching under the banner of the Black Lives Matter global network organization either. They're out there marching because they believe in the idea that Black Lives Matter. But I, I have to say, I, I'm going to say it one more time, Tammy. I, I think that it is actually, I think it hurts the cause much more than it helps because it, 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 it forces many in the community, in the Jewish community, mm -hmm. to, to sort of question, do they belong? And, and, and for this issue around police reform, criminal justice reform, I, I think that it, it, it's a negative much more than it is a positive. So, so Peter, let me jump in. Um, I, I think that the, the movement as a cause and as uh, something that everyone seemingly is, or many people are getting behind, that is the one that I think is a lot more powerful than whatever the organization is, whoever what the, what were the originators of the concept, God bless them. They got, at least they got the name out there but you have a movement that is much bigger and, and frankly transformative is international. And to me, it's, it's challenging, uh, not, it's, it's, it has the potential of being multidimensional. Mm -hmm. It's not just law enforcement, it's not just criminal justice reform, but it challenges this whole notion of systemic racism and white supremacy that is really interwoven not only in American society, but in many places around the world. And so you have black and white and brown people challenging all of these former notions and norms mm -hmm. that have been tolerated, which I think is beautiful, whether it is challenging the concept of having Confederate soldiers and generals, et cetera, in public places, or it's even challenging the European um, image of Jesus, which may not be necessarily based in any sort of historical fact. And to me, I just love the fact that now the norms are being challenged, and it's not just black people, it's white and brown and Asians who are challenging these norms that we have accepted for many years. And so I love the concept of the, the movement that's happening uh, I'm just, ex and I'm excited about where it can go in terms of really uh -huh. making this a better society. Yeah, and I, if I could, uh, the the concept also, I think we're we're all being forced to reckon with the the degree to which anti-black racism is a core feature of American society and and the way that America's economy uh, has been built. Uh, and that is, there is this, and, 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 and how all of us have been miseducated uh, to our history. I think my friend Sheffield Hale wrote a fantastic op-ed in the AJC that said, we have been taught lost cause mythology, not the history of the American South. Because the, in the history of American South, the, my church was founded the same year as the temple uh, in 1867. And uh, African Americans actually had the first degree granting institution in Atlanta. Uh, and this is not a history that we are taught. And so anti-blackness is what we all have to wrestle with, even those of us who are African American, because we have also been taught anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's what the Black Lives Matter as a movement really calls us to reckon with, uh, is white supremacy uh, but also that real feature of anti-blackness that so permeates so many institutions uh, and, and the whole structure of, of our country. Uh, that leads to a question that came in from the audience. And, and I, I wanna thank everybody for, for, I mean, this is, you know, again, another question that we could spend, you know, 47 hours talking about. And, uh, um, uh, but I do believe what's so powerful is uh, how many Jews are, are able to stand up and say without qualification, and as I said in my sermon at the temple, without saying but, are able to say Black Lives Matter. No qualification, hard stop. And that is so important right now. Mm -hmm. um, a question that came up, and it's related, Andrea, to something you said, we'll only have time for one person to answer because we're getting closer to our end. Uh, and uh, Dove, you're, you're Nogea Bedavar on this one, which means uh, roughly translating from the Hebrew, not allowed to answer because your mother, Simone, is asking it. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, have a better descriptive word 
than anti-racism, right? It, it, uh, meaning it has a negative connotation because the word anti is in there. Is there a better word, uh, Simone is asking? I think anti-racism is a really important concept because it says we have to act against racism. If we are not active, if we are not conscious, we, you know, racism is a toxic suit that we're all breathing. Um, mm -hmm. and so we have to be consciously uh, working against um, the racism that is, you know, that is uh, the default mode in so much of, you know, how we do things. You know, as Tammy pointed out, you know, COVID nineteen. Why do most why are some why is there predominance of African Americans? You know, getting COVID nineteen because when those of us who could uh, work from home were told to go home, no one said that. Oh well, we need to wear masks to protect the the store, grocery store clerks and the janitors and the bus drivers. And the president still won't do it. But that's a whole another discussion. But you know, this whole question of wearing masks, I is to me is an anti-black act. It is a white supremacist act to refuse to wear a mask around people who have less power than you do mm -hmm. because it puts them in danger and it shows that you, you know, and so that is, it, it, and so that's the whole question of really looking at how so many default things are actually perpetuating racism. We have to be anti-racist. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're at our last question, friends. Uh, the time, time flies. This is going to be the, the lightning round, which means our panelists each have 20 seconds each to answer because we're at the end. And so set your stopwatches. Uh, but at the end, of course, we want to ask you about turning your passion into action. On a local and a national level, we are in the midst of the, a huge debate right now around remedies to racial inequality, uh, especially about policing, uh, the, the subject of, of, of the film. In your view, in 20 seconds each, mm -hmm. what are the priorities and the opportunities for policy change? And how can our Black and Jewish communities work together uh, to achieve the goal that we all want to see? Whoever wants to jump in. So for me, uh, Peter, the concept of what's called criminal justice reinvestment. So uh, there are millions and millions of dollars that are invested in criminal justice as well as law enforcement. And so instead of the money is going into a, a hole in terms of incarceration, how do you redirect those funds and interventive and preventive programs on the front end of the school to prison pipeline? And so to me, the concept of criminal justice reinvestment is one that I'm going to embrace and champion in terms of policy. Yeah, I will second that. Divest from armed response and invest in community uh, responses. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'll add that there's a, there's a piece of legislation in, in the, the U.S. Senate called the No Hate Act, and the No Hate Act will um, enhance reporting capabilities by local uh -huh. enforcement. And, you know, we just passed the hate crimes legislation in Georgia. We want the governor to, we believe hopefully the governor will sign it. But we also need the federal level to pass this bill so that, that, that the reporting can influence the way that our legislators and our law enforcement sort of understand the, many of the issues facing our communities. I guess my thinking is I agree with everything. I agree with everything that was just said. Um, the right now, the city hall of New York City is being occupied. I mean, the per, the, the circle around city hall, and people are camping out there. I think tonight's going to be either the third or the fourth night. The demand is defund the police. Now you're not going to defund the police right now, or I mean, that's a real strategy, but it's a call it's a cry and the demand in new york is to take one billion dollars out of the budget and that's a lot of money and it's just the beginning we have to see that money come out of the policing in this country and be reinvested reinvested in housing in health care reinvested in infrastructure reinvested in the school systems and public higher education so getting the money, the demand to get money out of policing is, is critical at this historic moment. And I think we can do it. I think we will win. And there's, a, of course, a huge spectrum of belief on, on um, uh, uh, what it means to defund and uh, you know people are going to have to really engage in that conversation because it's very complicated and um, we, we, of course, need our police and, uh, uh, and so uh, 
that's the conversation. And Tammy, you raised the question, how, how do we make the changes that we need to make um, given the, the, the climate that we're in? Um, I wanna take this opportunity really to thank each of you. John and Dove, Andrea and Tammy, you are um, exceptional speakers and leaders and gave our community a tremendous gift tonight. Along with uh, the staff and the leadership of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival, uh, the American Jewish Committee and the Black Jewish Coalition, uh, we thank each and every one of you. At the conclusion of our program, please hang on for just a couple of minutes more. Uh, you will be directed to uh, a, a brief survey, uh, an opportunity to uh, offer your comments about the program. So please do stay on for just a couple of seconds for that. And if you wanna learn more about the upcoming programs of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival, you can find that at the website www.ajff.org and you can subscribe to all of the upcoming programs. I'll close by sharing just a simple word. Most Jewish uh, worship services end with a prayer called Aleinu Lishabeach. We're not gonna stand up and say that prayer right now, but it does end with the words, Litaken Olam B'Malchut Shaddai, that each of us, as I loosely translate it, um, have the obligation to use our hearts and our hands to fix and repair the world and to leave it a better place for our children and for our children's children. Thank you for being here tonight, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you.